Thank you very much, Nigel, for that very kind introduction. And it's really my honor to be presenting the 2014 Peter Wilde uh, Prize Lecture. Uh, so I really want to thank the Society for the award. But um, I have to say, science is probably the only area in which uh, people would give you an award that it entails more work. <laughs> the phrase prize lecture does not compute in any other area of human endeavor, as far as I'm aware. So, thank you. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks a lot. <laughs> but I guess I am a scientist, so I have to play by the rules. And I did actually do a little bit of research uh, for my talk tonight. I looked at uh, what other people do when they get awards. And when you go to the Oscars or the BAFTAs, then uh, what the awardee does is there's usually a short, rambling, occasionally incoherent speech. Uh, and as often as not, there are tears. I was kind of surprised that Rita Coldwell uh, deviated significantly from that template in her uh, talk this morning. So I'm not sure what you're going to make of what's about to follow. So, um, but seriously, I am honoured uh, to get uh, the award. I'm also a bit surprised because, truth be told, I, I don't really think I've done anything terribly special or, or difficult. What I've done, uh, from what you heard from Nigel, is that I started writing a blog, and then basically what I've done is uh, react to the things that happened to me because I started writing a blog, many of which I simply didn't expect or anticipate. And so... Um, uh, it's, it's a little bit strange to be here uh, speaking you, to you tonight. I'm also a bit nervous because I know that uh, people who get awards tend to get ideas above their station and uh, it can be dangerous for us. We can start to think that we're the only people who deserve these sorts of things and that our ideas are always um, uh, the best. And so, that, you know, if it comes to science communication, then I'm going to be the only go-to guy. That certainly isn't true and I hope I don't uh, fall into that trap. I'm certainly an admirer of the work of the two previous recipients, uh, last year, uh, David Bella, and then the year before, uh, Vincent Racaniello, both of whom I know uh, personally. And um, they've done very good work, and, but you know, th th they and there are other people actually in this uh, room who are uh, artful practitioner, practitioners of science communication. I think of Wendy Barclay and Lucy Thorne, just to name two, but I'm sure there are uh, plenty of others. And what these people have in common is that they took a risk uh, because there is still a fear, a sense within the scientific community that if you are devoting yourself to public engagement activities and science communication, then you, you are uh, risking being a bit frivolous, not getting on with the real business of science. We have a value system that recognizes primarily research papers and grant awards. Uh, in the university sector, of course, then teaching maybe comes second to that. Uh, and then maybe committee work, and then maybe somewhere down the line beyond that, um, public engagement. I think there's a risk, some people see it as being uh, frivolous, as being a distraction from the real business of science, and I certainly hope that um, we can counter that view, and certainly this award, uh, I hope, helps to, uh, to do that. We know, of course, that there are uh, many people who are slightly sniffy, shall we say, about the uh, work of Professor Brian Cox, uh, particularly, per perhaps, uh, when he veers off the physics area, as I have done, into life sciences. Um, and I think, you know, some of that is naked jealousy. Uh, he's, uh, he's young, he's good-looking, um, he's uh, successful, he's on TV, um, he's a celebrity now, and he goes to better parties than we do. <laughs> but I think some of it also derives from the fact that uh, actually working on television, that you, most people don't realise it's actually quite hard to do well. And I think, largely, then, the output that uh, Brian Cox has on television and radio, uh, he does do very well, and I think he's genuinely um, committed to it. But they're all risk-takers, and I think Brian Cox also uh, is a risk-taker because he has um, decided to put his um, uh, 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 efforts into this area. Now, it's not always glamorous, and here's me not being uh, glamorous, so yeah, this, uh, and, and most of what happens 
in science communication is simply hard work where you just get on and, and do it. And if you're looking to get into it because you've been lured by news of the success and the fame and fortune of uh, Professor Brian Cox, then you're being motivated for the wrong reasons and you're probably uh, doing it wrong in any case. So I think you've got to seek out the rewards within it that, uh, that speak to you. And I think those rewards are genuine. It's not really about becoming a celebrity of any, uh, of any sort. I think it's an important aspect um, of the scientific life. The rewards that I could identify, I think, would giving you an enlarged sense of what it means to be a scientist and a citizen in 21st century, uh, the 21st century world. We are uh, very much a global village these days. I think for many of us, of course, we are publicly funded or charitably funded, and there is a sense of responsibility in giving a good account of the money that we spend uh, on the taxpayer's behalf or the donor's behalf uh, in doing the science that we do. And I think there's great satisfaction to be gained from doing that well. I think it can be self-improving. I think it stretches us as investigators if we are able to explain the relevance and importance uh, of the work that we do as scientists to a broader audience, whether that's uh, scientists outside our disciplines, which is healthy, of course, for the subject itself, uh, but also then to the wider public. So there are, uh, and you know, my experience has certainly been that you know, the public have a great fascination for science, and it's actually uh, quite rewarding in itself just to expose yourself to that enthusiasm. And they often ask quite tough and quite unexpected questions of you, and so it can also help to sort of energise your own thought processes. We do tend to get into silos a little bit. And we are, as a species, um, as we heard this morning, um, not necessarily the best at social interaction. Jonathan Reed showed us actually real data uh, for that, for the fact that scientists um, don't get out, uh, or only get out about as much as people who are unemployed. And, and I think that's a sort of... That's a reputation that we have to shake off. Now, in part, I think our intense fixation with work in the laboratory is, is, is necessary uh, because of the detailed and difficult work that we're doing um, as researchers. But the flip side of that is that, you know, that creates barriers to the outside world. We are seeing something of, of a, a race apart or a species apart compared to the ordinary man and woman in the street. And I think it would be good... Um, if more of us could open the doors of the laboratory, both to get outside ourselves and mix it up with the public, but also then um, to invite them in. Now, my motivation, certainly for getting into this business, were largely, as uh, Nigel said in his introduction, to demystify the process of science. That was my, my, my main aim for uh, getting into to blogging. And my aim tonight, hopefully, is to demystify the process of science communication so that um, some more people uh, might uh, get involved in it or if they've been thinking about it but being, uh, have been a bit shy or a bit nervous about whether or not they should really spend time on it, they're willing perhaps to encourage you. I have found that once you start, you can't really stop. It is like a kind of infection. And so um, I would like, in my remarks tonight, to try and infect you a little bit. <coughs> <laughs> this room isn't really big enough for this sort of thing. Anyway, so where to begin? Well, I started with a blank sheet of paper. So this is the sort of thing that used to torture me. Uh, it was in all grant applications, uh, write so many words on your plans for public engagement. And I used to sort of stare at this and stare at it, and it kind of used to drive me nuts. And I never quite knew what to put in it. Um, I kind of thought, oh, well, I can sort of put down that I'll go and give a talk at my children's school, and maybe I'll give a talk or something on the day that... Uh, if there's a, a science festival comes to the university. And I, I never really gave it an awful lot of thought, and that was partly because I knew that the funding agency was never really going to check up on it, so it didn't really matter um, what I put. But um, the sort of feeling nagged away at me a bit. I mean, I did have this sense of uh, a public responsibility, a public duty. And um, I have slowly, uh, sort of in the uh, mid 2000s sort of became aware of the internet. Well, I was aware of the internet before that, but I was aware of the internet or the part of the internet that's known as the blogosphere. And this is basically where anyone can, with a, um, um, can write uh, and publish uh, the information that they uh, find uh, in the recesses of their mind. There's a saying that it used to be said that if you put enough monkeys um, down beside enough typewriters, then eventually one of them would produce a work the worthy of Shakespeare. Uh, but now that we have the internet, we know that that's not true. <laughs> However true that may be, uh, there are still uh, areas of quality, I would hope, uh, in the blogosphere. 
But even so, I did hesitate, actually, because uh, blogging doesn't have a fantastic reputation um, among the scientific community necessarily. It certainly didn't then. I think it is changing slowly uh, because there are many good uh, practitioners out there. But the sort of uh, received wisdom would be something along the lines of what Elliot Gould's character in the movie Contagion uh, said to Jude Law. Blogging isn't writing, it's graffiti with punctuation. Well, at least we got the punctuation right, but... Uh, but again, it was seen as a sort of a, a frivolous uh, po possible activity, and so I did hesitate a bit. We, uh, we liked to sort of uh, um, a bitch about uh, peer review as a sort of negative process, uh, and certainly it has got its faults, but actually it is a bit of a comfort blanket to many of us because at least we know that um, our words will be read by somebody else before they go public, and so there's a bit of a crutch there uh, that means that maybe hopefully the worst mistakes that we um, produced in the uh, submitted draft uh, will have been excised before we get out there. But blogging is a much more direct um, uh, activity. It's, I like to think of it as uh, thinking out loud in public. And before you go public, you really do uh, have to get your thoughts in order. order. So it is, there is a certain discipline um, to it um, and that I think is, is healthy. But even so, you know, I, was, you know, I was nervous about it and I, I can understand the reasons that, uh, that people would be, particularly junior researchers, because you are exposing yourself. I started off initially um, by just sort of leaving comments on other people's blogs and uh, that, was, that was quite a nice way to do it because uh, you find actually sometimes you got into a conversation, people didn't uh, immediately dismiss what you said uh, and you could uh, engage in a rather constructive conversation uh, with, a, with, a, with a broader audience. But eventually then I kind of summed up the courage myself to start my own blog and finally wrote my very first post. Now, you can see from the title that I was still struggling uh, with the notion of the, uh, the activity. Uh, the word itself, I still kind of um, repel, it repels me uh, somewhat, but I'm, you know, I'm learning to live with it. But I uh, decided to give it a go. Um, uh, in that first post, I actually uh, wrote my manifesto, my blog manifesto, or perhaps my blog anti-manifesto, since it's couched rather negatively. I won't promise to post regularly. I won't promise to be unembarrassed to admit that I'm a blogger. Uh, I won't promise to have anything terribly insightful to say. And I'm very proud, I've been blogging for six years, and I'm very proud to be able to tell you tonight that I am a man of my word. <laughs> so, but I started it and um, it seemed to go okay. It was a good response um, from uh, many quarters. I actually started on a network because if you start a blog um, by yourself, then it can be quite difficult to build an audience. And so if you are thinking about it, then uh, going into a preformed network helps to sort of give you a bit of momentum because you at least know that some people uh, will be reading it. You know, it is a bit soul-destroying to write stuff that then you think nobody reads. A bit like writing scientific articles. <laughs> now, but, of course, there are wilder shores of the internet and there certainly can be unpleasantness. And it's definitely true that for women in particular, the internet can be a very rough place at times. There's some extraordinarily unpleasant behaviour um, out there. But the scientific blogosphere hopefully is mostly uh, immune um, from that. And so it's a worthy thing to do. Now what I found was that once I'd opened my gob, it was difficult to shut up. And so having summoned up the courage to start a blog and then started writing posts, uh, I find myself when Simon Jenkins um, wrote one of his execrable uh, diatribes in The Guardian. I don't, some scientists must have dropped him on the head as a youth or something. Uh, but he, he really has got it in for scientists. He actually writes quite coherently on other topics, but uh, on science I've yet to see anything good. But anyway, apparently we were the new clerisy uh, um, you know, and standing on pedestals, every single one of us. So with Bill Hanage and a colleague of mine at Imperial at the time, um, I, we sort of banged on the door at the Guardian and said, oh, hang on a minute, you can't say this, we want the right of reply. And uh, because I think we'd had the, just the experience of blogging and writing then, we had the, uh, the, the guts to do that. And so that was just helps to get you out further um, into the public domain. Now, I don't quite know what the impact of just saying to Simon Jenkins, oh, no, it isn't, uh, achieves necessarily. But it, uh, I guess I think it did rally a bit of support among the scientific community who felt a little bit persecuted by his remarks. And it helps to get the argument um, out there into a, a much broader uh, public domain. And although blogging, again, we sort of come back to this notion that it's a slightly disreputable activity, it's the sort of thing that spotty males do in their bedrooms uh, with the door locked and the curtains drawn, um, I had found that the opposite was actually true. It's an activity, although it, it, it of course, is necessarily insular because you're sitting down at a keyboard, 
but it really did pull you out of the lab and out of the office and into um, the rest of society. And one of the sort of uh, early contacts I had made through blogging was with uh, Matt Brown, who told me about an organisation called Skeptics in the Pub. And actually the very first or, uh, meeting that I went to um, happened around the time that uh, Simon Singh was embroiled in a uh, libel trial. He'd been sued by the British Chiropractic Association for declaring that uh, they happily promote bogus treatments. And this was deemed libelous at the time. They sued him. Uh, and there was a, a, a sort of rousing meeting in a pub in Holborn um, in London, and this is in uh, 2009. He just had an adverse judgment uh, during the process, uh, and but what was happening was that he'd written an article, he'd written a book, uh, of sort of uh, looking at the evidence-based alternative medicine and found it wanting in many places, and then when he wrote an article about the book in The Guardian, he got clobbered by uh, the BCA, thanks to the rather uh, lax uh, libel laws that we had in uh, England and Wales at the time. So this was an issue that sort of uh, fired me up. It was kind of fascinating to see science being debated uh, in the court. I actually was able to go along to the Royal Courts of Justice in London to, to the hearings. I had no idea beforehand. You could just turn up and go into these things uh, for free. There's no entry charge. Uh, and it was fascinating really to hear Singh's lawyers and the BCA then sort of discuss the, fin the, the, the finer details of what exactly constitutes scientific evidence uh, in a court of law. It was bizarre that it wasn't a, a research seminar. But it shows you that these scientific issues do percolate out uh, into many other and sometimes unexpected areas of society. Now eventually, uh, uh, Singh was allowed to sort of challenge the initial judgment and uh, the, the tide of the, court, of the court case turned in his favour and that was in about April 2010 and eventually the BCA dropped the case. Now he was still relatively out of pocket because the, uh, the law of the land made it uh, easy to sort of uh, fling a charge of libel at somebody and often that would, that would close down discussion on matters, and often matters of medical research and matters of public health, um, because, for, uh, because large organisations could just threaten to libel, and people basically knew that um, there were very, very expensive cases to defend. And the only reason that Simon Sig, Singh could defend it was A, because he he's a very courageous individual to have done so, but also because he's very wealthy. He's a very successful author and he'd made a lot of money. So he knew he could, he could afford to lose it, although he didn't want to, um, but he, he was facing losses of something like half a million uh, pounds if he lost. But he didn't, and actually the campaign, which I wrote about in my blog, I mean, I wasn't a very particular, uh, particularly active in the campaign, I'm certainly not claiming any, any ma major role, but I did write about it a lot and did sort of go along to offer uh, support uh, at various instances. And there was a campaign then that was coordinated by the Index on Censorship, Sense About Science and English Pen, uh, and eventually, amazingly really, uh, in this day and age, has led to a change in the law. And so the Defamation Act uh, of 2013 is now an Act of Parliament, and it means that peer-reviewed science, for the first time in this country, uh, uh, cannot land you in court, okay? So you cannot bring libel against a scientist who's published uh, in the peer-reviewed literature. And there are various other protections that have been brought about because of that. But it was fascinating to sort of uh, watch from the sidelines to be writing about it and to see exactly how these issues um, played out. Very, very different from doing um, structural biology on um, noroviruses. And those kind of experiences and uh, dealing with those sorts of issues um, brings you into sort of the public health domain, which is a domain, of course, that many people associated with the, the society uh, would be interested in. And no doubt you're likely talking to people about your research and coming up against um, various uh, ideas, some of them crazy, uh, some of them very alternative about um, public health. And I think it's important for us as a community to challenge those sorts of views, but uh, necessarily to do so in a way that is respectful. I mean, often you do have debates, and certainly the blogosphere is, uh, is perhaps one of the worst places for this, that become extraordinarily strident and angry, and uh, you just, the discussion just get degenerates into a flame war, and there's no enlightenment, uh, and the exercise is all rather pointless. So if anyone is um, planning on getting into that, then I would um, suggest that you um, you know, hold your fire, don't take the Travis Bickle approach to uh, changing people's minds, which is by rearranging them with a bullet. Uh, rather, try to engage and be respectful, even if they believe in homeopathy, even if they believe in uh, the creation uh, story of Genesis, uh, uh, treat them with individual respect. It's, a, it's a, 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 an approach that is, was adopted and uh, um, taken by one of the great science communicators of all time, Carl Sagan. Uh, whose books are well worth uh, reading. 
So there's many different aspects to um, science communication. One of the most exciting things that I got involved in, and again, it was I don't actually remember how I got involved in this, but I'm pretty sure it was through the blog and through a contact that I had made. I heard about this competition called I'm a Scientist, Get Me Out of Here. Now, it's more or less the same sort of principle as I'm a Celebrity, Get Me Out of Here, uh, but you don't get flown to Australia and you don't have to live in the jungle for a couple of weeks, which is good, and you don't have to meet and deal with Ant and Deck. Uh, it happens all online, but it, it's, a, it's an online competition that provides direct uh, interaction between school children around the country and then a, a group of five scientists. So there are a number of, th I was in the imaging zone, as you can see, uh, and um, there's a number of different zones running at the same time. And so it's a great um, uh, example of an initiative that allows direct contact between scientists and school children. I find it extraordinarily uh, energizing. They had fantastic questions, and the great thing about it is that it's entirely driven by the students. Uh, they get to choose who's in the zones, they get to write all the questions, and you have to, for the first week of the competition, all five of you have to sort of write answers. You either do it online through, uh, use, through the website in the evening, and then occasionally through that first week there are 45 minute live chat sessions uh, on the internet between the five of you and then a group of school children in, in a class somewhere uh, else in the country uh, who are shepherded by their teacher. And those are very intense 45 minute periods. So if you are thinking of entering, then I would recommend that you uh, brush up your typing skills. But it was, it was fascinating to be directly exposed to it. And ultimately then in the second week of the competition, the children vote for their favorite scientists and the ones every day for the second week, the one with the least votes gets evicted uh, according to the brutal rules of the competition. I was lucky to be left standing. Uh, it was a very uh, proud moment for me. Um, but it, it, what was fantastic about it was that it really exposed you to how fascinated the children were uh, about science. And it was a very rewarding experience to be able to sort of talk directly to them. And again, it, it was a great opportunity to demystify uh, the process of science. We kept getting asked, uh, what would you do if you won a Nobel Prize? And the five of us are sitting there thinking, that's not going to happen. You know, what am I going to do? And I said, um, I'd buy a house by the sea for my wife. Uh, and the reply came back slightly plaintively, oh, uh, wouldn't you spend it on research? <laughs> and I sat there thinking, I've just won a Nobel Prize, I've done my bit. <laughs> but I just replied, my wife really wants that house. <laughs> but it really did make me think, and it, you know, they had such optimism and such uh, faith in the power of science to solve all the world's problems. Uh, th that it was kind of refreshing, but it was a little bit scary as well because, uh, you know, they, they, this question about Nobel Prizes and being a genius, it did make me think that they've got this idea that, you know, the, uh, it's, only it's only geniuses, it's only super intelligent people which they don't see themselves as that can do science. And I know, of course, from looking around this room, uh, that that isn't true. <laughs> and, of course, we all know that as well. Uh, and so the, 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 was the prize money I got, I made a short film in which I interviewed a number of different people, one of whom is a Nobel Prize winner, but uh, with Tim Hunt, there you can see in the middle. Uh, but just to, sh just to sort of do interviews with them to talk about the, their ordinary lives and what it was that had inspired them, and just to show them, uh, uh, it was just an exercise in, in showing the children uh, uh, that the scientists really are ordinary people too. Because it is astonishing, you know, we, we assume that we are the same as everybody else, and we are. We are, but other people don't assume that, and I think we do need to work hard to break down those barriers. Anyway, having made that film, I had opportunities then to make other um, uh, videos and films, actually most recently with the Royal Institution, so we had the last one was released last Thursday, uh, and th th this is a great opportunity again to reach a very um, broad audience. And this is sort of showing you again, it's the internet that's changed everything. You know, 10 years ago, it would have been very difficult a, to make and edit a film, and then to distribute it. And now these days, uh, you know, if you've got a mobile phone that's a, a decent, you know, only a year or two old, then you've got a high definition video camera uh, in your pocket and you can immediately make a movie and then upload it to the internet. So we have got fantastic opportunities and we do want to uh, be able to uh, make more use of it. So politics uh, started for me in uh, 2010 uh, and again as Nigel alluded to in the, in the opening. So once you start thinking about the broader issues of science, you start thinking about the children and the libel cases and uh, public policy, then of course in 2010 we had a change of government and uh, over the summer they started making some very grey and grim noises about the likely uh, austerity budget that was going to hit every single government department. 
and uh, Vince Cable went on Radio 4 and made some um, spectacularly ill-informed remarks about uh, the quality of British science. He said only 45% of it was excellent, uh, judged by the RIE, um, which was an incredible misreading since it was over 90%, um, uh, three star or four star according to the categories at the time. Um, I got a bit incensed about this and uh, with Evan Harris when we wrote to The Guardian, but that's because I'm a kind of let's write to the newspapers kind of a guy. Uh, but a friend of mine, uh, Jennifer Round, who's at UCL, uh, had a slightly different idea, wrote a blog post about being fed up with science getting clobbered all the time and sort of announced a call to arms, uh, proclaiming, you know, no more Dr. Nice Guy, let's take to the streets and march and protest against the threat of cuts to science because science is the thing that really helps to uh, drive innovation and discovery and is something that Britain does extraordinarily well and needs to be protected and nurtured and invested in. And so, and again, this was largely due, you can see I knew Jenny through the blog, uh, so there was a number of us volunteered sort of within a couple of hours uh, and that was what led then to the genesis of the Science is Vital campaign. And this campaign, I think, really shows you, I mean, it was a spectacular success and it was really, really hard work, but it wasn't actually technically difficult to do because we had all uh, the tools uh, that we needed. Um, for example, we had access to pubs where we could have meetings. Um, but more importantly, and the campaign uh, was obviously was sort of supported right from the beginning by the campaign for science and engineering, which was, I can guess, the precursor for Science is Vital from 25 years ago. But we rapidly were able to produce um, a Facebook page when, on the first day. We got a website app, we had a Twitter feed and a hashtag um, sorted out. Um, Evan Harris was on the uh, uh, executive sort of planning it. And this was basically 40 days, 42 days before the autumn statement, which, is, which was our deadline for getting action. So the cable had spoken on about the 8th of September and the, uh, the, uh, George Rosborne was going to stand up and announce his spending cuts on the 20th um, of October. But uh, thanks to organisation and the online tools and Evan Harris's address book, so we got a, a sort of couple of celebrities, you know, it has got its uses, um, celebrity, and Brian Cox was a, a, a big supporter of it. It was amazing to see how many signatures were added to the petition every time he tweeted about it. It really was um, uh, something to behold. But it was, you know, it was very hard work, uh, extraordinarily intense period of time. It was not glamorous. Um, okay, so here we are um, assembling placards the night before. Uh, I was stewarding on the day, uh, and we didn't really know quite how well it was going to go. Uh, but fortunately, it seemed to go rather well. So we had sort of over 2,000 people, scientists and members of the public, um, coming to a, a rally right outside Parliament. Uh, and uh, which was a blessed relief for us, I can tell you, uh, on the day. And it got good media coverage um, in, the, um, in the press and in the media. We, uh, we told all the scientists to turn in white coats. Uh, again, just sort of uh, media savvy. It was a good, uh, a good stunt to see, you know. And again, people were surprised to see scientists outside the lab and on the streets. You know, that was quite newsworthy in and of itself. Oh, but actually they're also protesting about the threat of cuts to the science budget. So uh, there was a lobby of parliament and then a petition of over 35,000 signatures, which I imagine many of you, I hope, will have signed, uh, was presented then to, uh, to 10 Downing Street. And that led to meetings with the minister. And I know, you know, Science is Vital is not claiming at all um, uh, full credit for this. There were many, many other uh, uh, lines of communication and pressure put on uh, government, both uh, sort of in public and in private, through many learned societies and in the Royal Society was um, heavily involved. But ultimately, it really did um, make a difference. So the science budget was protected, cash limited, and then they, of course, hacked into the capital budget uh, thereafter. So it wasn't necessarily a bed of roses, but it did survive, relatively speaking, compared to many um, other departments. And what it shows you really is what, you know, what a small number of people can do if they're dedicated enough and if they know their way around the internet. And it's really quite a contrast between what happened then in 2010, in 40 days or so, compared to what happened 25 years ago when Save British Science um, formed, and they had basically spent six weeks telephoning around trying to raise money in order to put a full page advert in the Times. Um, but uh, you know, these days we not, might not be able to track viruses in real time, as we heard this morning, but we can sort of track political action uh, in more or less real time and try to keep pressure on them. And I think one of the really good things I think that came out of that was that it showed the scientific community what they really could do if they you know, got off their backsides out of the lab uh, and, and actually did something about the science that they care about in the public domain. 
So I hope it will be a, a good example for next time, because there, there may well be a next time. Uh, since 2010, the, the organisation has kept going. We're, we're not a very well-funded organisation. We're all amateurs and we're all very much part-timers because we've all got other jobs to do. Uh, but we've looked at uh, sort of, and we've, what we have is a resource which is a huge database of people who are supporting many uh, working scientists, and we've been able, to, uh, we can access that to really get a ground's eye view of what's going on at the coal face. We did a report in 2011 on uh, science careers, particularly the, the crisis that's facing many junior researchers. And then uh, just in the past year, then looked again, uh, asked people around the country what was the impact of the cash freeze, because we know that the budget is going down, and we were able to sort of extract that data and prepare a report, which we then presented um, directly to the minister in, in Victoria, or in Whitehall. So we are still going, and of course there is going to be an election next year, so um, watch out for details, because we and the Campaign for Science and Engineering are certainly gearing up for that. We want to keep science um, on the agenda. And we're not the only ones doing this. You know, that, uh, one of the things I hope that would come out of Science is Vital is that it would help to inspire and show other people that you know, this stuff really is feasible, you know, is doable. And there's a wonderful organisation called Science Girl, uh, whose motive it really is to sort of show that you know, science really is for everyone and to tackle this uh, gender bias that we suffer throughout society, then of course in science, not so much at junior levels, but of course one sees the attrition, the erosion and the loss of uh, women scientists from the profession um, as they progress through their careers, or in their case, of course, not progressing through their careers. And this, again, is, is from the ground up. I'm not involved in this at all, I'm, I'm, uh, but it's just to sort of show you that the, you know, there's other people getting out there and doing this, and there's, you know, there is some really great work um, going on to change the world. So um, that's science and society a little bit. You know, every so often I will write a blog post about my work. Uh, 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 this was about sort of a, a particularly tortuous night we had once at, at the Diamond Synchrotron um, doing work. And I was also able to write as to, uh, and I have a sort of, we have a spot on The Guardian as well, so um, we can uh, write there when we like. And I covered the, uh, the paper that came out. This is largely work led by Dave Stewart at Oxford and Brian Charleston at uh, Purbright and Ian Jones at Reading and various other um, people. We were peripherally involved by providing some reagents because actually somewhat accidentally or serendipitously some of the mutants that we had been working on of the foot and mouth disease virus 3C protease were actually good candidates for using as a tool to help um, um, sort of uh, downregulate the toxic toxicity of the proteases they were using for their um, expression system. So I was able to sort of put it, fill in the, the, the background on that uh, just to sort of, because I think it was a nice story about uh, sort of uh, how accidents happen in science and often give you uh, an interesting and unexpected result. Um, but it's not all serious. Um, I'm a big fan of Swedish crime and, and uh, Scandinavian crime drama. Um, but I have to say I was a bit disappointed with episode 9 of The Bridge. Uh, those of you that have seen it, there was a really horrendous piece of non-virology uh, on which the whole plot uh, uh, hung uh, and it kind of, uh, it really did kind of ruin it for me. Uh, now, one has to be careful, I did say that the blogosphere is quite a friendly place, but even though I, you know, I thought I had put in plenty of warnings, you know, the title of the piece says, spoiler alert, uh, warning, do not read this blog post if you have not yet seen the final episode of season two of The Bridge. Um, but even so, uh, after I promoted the blog post on Twitter, um, I got this response from a disgruntled Seamus <laughs> of Ireland. Um, so I don't know how he managed to read the spoilers, since he obviously hadn't read the title or the stand first, but there you go. To Seamus, I can only say I'm really, really sorry. So, and again, uh, blogging and writing, it's thinking out loud and it makes you think about all aspects of your work. I mean, I'm heavily involved at the minute in um, organising the teaching in our department. Uh, and also, having come from a physics background into life sciences, I'm quite interested in, you know, how to teach maths effectively to uh, life sciences students. So I wrote about uh, teaching maths. Um, I wrote about the consumerist um, philosophy that's now sort of penetrating into the university system thanks to the introduction of £9,000 um, top-up fees and uh, students are being sold a lie effectively that they are consumers and uh, universities are having to sort of jump through hoops of um, consumer satisfaction surveys and I really want to resist that. I'm very happy to have dialogue and conversations with students but I don't really want them to uh, to feel that you know, we are in the retail business of education, we are in the, the real business um, of education. 
And one of the other things that we've been able to do is to introduce a science communication course as part of our final year undergraduate uh, teaching um, at Imperial College. Uh, so this is a month-long course that, and again, it sort of teaches them, and Wendy Barker is very good, uh, helps us teach us on that, about uh, nasty people who go around creating uh, very dangerous flu viruses and how society might cope with that. So it's a, it's a really good way of getting the students to think about and engage with the implications and the fallout, or the potential fallout, of the science that they do. We spend an awful lot of time sort of drumming biochemistry and biology into them in our department, but uh, not enough opportunities, I think, to sort of teach them about what that really means, because many of them aren't going to become scientists, and even if they are, they do still need to think about the broader um, implications of this. So, as I said, and it's really my main message, the internet has changed everything, and it isn't done yet. And one of the things that it's still changing um, is the business of academic publishing. So um, I'm sneaking in my opportunity here to, to bang on about open access. I, I'm, I'm, I, I am in favour of it. Scientific journals were a fantastic idea, printed on paper when they were introduced in the 1600s. Uh, but of course, now that we have the internet, then we don't really need to be printing things um, on paper. And we have much better ways of disseminating information. And the UK government has certainly woken up to that. The Finch Report, which was published in 2012, has many flaws, of course, uh, uh, particularly about the model that they've adopted, but it does at least establish the principle in the public mind as official um, government policy. So the principle that the results of research that has been publicly funded should be freely accessible in the public domain is a compelling one and fundamentally unanswerable. And I think, and I think from some of the discussions we've heard today, is science itself is moving in that direction of being more open um, and more sharing. But it is a challenge, it is a difficult thing to do, and I'm just mentioning it partly because it's a, an issue that I've picked up on in my blog in the past couple of years, written quite a lot of it about it. I could bore for Britain, I think, on the subject of open access. Um, hopefully it'll be an Olympic event one of these days. But um, I, I do think it's a, a good thing. I think it's an, ine an inevitable cultural change as a result of the fact that you know, we have a web-connected uh, world. I think it's good for research in that it helps to foster the exchange of ideas, it, which helps because it makes the literature accessible to foster interdisciplinarity, and that's a very good and rich uh, interface in which many new and unexpected ideas um, crop up. And I think also it's giving us an opportunity to actually to take back ownership of the scientific literature, and that's something that we gave away rather carelessly, I would say, um, through the last sort of uh, t uh, 20 or 30 years. I think it's good for the taxpayer. I am a taxpayer myself, so um, I do like to see um, public money being spent wisely. And ultimately, although there are concerns that, that the transition is going to be costly, it will be beneficial um, to the taxpayer and to the scientific community because we should get much more cost-effective methods um, of publication. It gives the public access to the research that they paid for, and they have an absolute right um, to that. And I think, actually, if they start exercising that right, and I hope that they do, that it will actually help to change the dynamic of public engagement, because it will make them demand a type of scientific literature that is a bit more accessible to them. Now, I don't mean to say that we're not then going to be forced to write all our uh, scientific papers in lay terms, but I think the practice of writing a lay summary on every single paper um, simply ought to become mandatory. And in many journals, we're now seeing that practice um, being adopted, eLife being one um, notif notable recent example. And open access is coming anyway, whether we like it or not, actually, because the, uh, you know, the, the funders have seen the writing on the wall. Uh, the internet uh, cannot be turned off. And we now see from RCUK, from HEFSI, from Wellcome, from NIH and from the EU that there are going to be mandates um, for your work to be freely available on the internet for anybody to read, hopefully also to text mine and preferentially also then to reuse in any way that they see fit. Uh, but if you want to be have papers that are, you can submit to the REF in 2020 or whenever the next one is, um, Lord spare us, uh, uh, then it will have to be open access. That's the policy most recently announced by HEFSI. Now, we know that this makes, entails changes to the subscription models that many learning societies, for example, um, have used as a profitable source of income with which, you know, and you, to generate funds which then fund many important activities of societies. But I do think that societies are going to have to face um, those challenges. There aren't easy answers yet. Um, but ultimately, the business of a, of a learning society is to promote its discipline. And what better way to promote it than to make the results of that discipline available to the widest possible readership? 
But it, it is slow going, it is difficult, there's political challenges, there's financial challenges. And uh, one of the difficulties we have is that the, the whole process is challenging the hegemony of uh, established um, legacy um, publishers and journals. And one of the difficulties we have with that uh, is that you know, we are obsessed with impact factors and we, we are obsessed with that because we've allowed it to infect our uh, career structures, our reward structures, and too many universities and too many uh, grant funding agencies uh, rely too easily on this so-called proxy for, um, um, for quality. It's not a proxy for quality. It's uh, interesting if you get published in a so-called high-impact journal, uh, but that should only really be the first step in assessing a paper. You only can actually assess scientific quality at the paper level, and you do actually have to read the paper and evaluate the science. You should not assume that just because it's in science that it's good science, as we have seen um, on a number of occasions. So, uh, we, you know, it, this is slowly changing and the funders are doing um, their bit, um, but it will take more than the funders. The Wellcome Trust has a standing policy and it's actually integral into their open access policy that it's the intrinsic merit of the work and not the title of the journal uh, that should be considered in making funding decisions. Now, it's one thing to say that, it's quite another thing to make sure that your grant panels enact that because it has become a reflex for all of us and we really do need um, to cure ourselves of that uh, reflex. One of the things that I was able to do just through the blog was to sort of, I knew that the RCUK was revising its open access policy and I just wrote a post that asked lots of people to sort of sign a, an open letter asking RCUK to adopt a similar statement in their um, um, open access policy and as guidance to their uh, grant panels. And that was very much pushing an open, at an open door because I think they were very sympathetic to the idea, but it just shows you again um, that you know, just a little bit writing a blog post, getting a few signatures on a letter, can actually um, make a, a significant um, degree of change. But of course, it will take more than changing the wording on a policy document, document um, to change the world. I'm not quite that uh, deluded. But I do think this whole area um, of so challenging impact factors and challenging the sort of established position of uh, so-called prestige journals is important not just to sort of clear the ground to allow and encourage the growth of new and innovative open access publishers, which is necessary to generate the market that will drive prices down and that will give us better value for money for our research pounds and research dollars. But I do think it's part of a drive to uh, rescue, I think, uh, our community from uh, this addiction with impact factors and with using it as a proxy for assessment in so many different areas, not just for grant applications, but also, of course, for promotions. And you will, you will have seen and heard many PhD students and postdocs think saying that, you know, I've got to get a nature cell or science paper if I'm going to get a career. And that's a kind of terrible burden to have placed on such young shoulders. And I do think that we have to step up and be more mindful of looking at the individual more holistically. And there are people like Ron Vale and Peter Lawrence who've written very uh, eloquently on this subject and I would commend um, all their writings to you. And they really are pushing the message that we've got to look not just at what the papers people publish, but look at their contribution to the scientific community as a whole. You know, how good are they at mentoring um, students? How good are they at teaching? Um, and what other activities do they do? If they are involved in public engagement, then it would be nice that that uh, was also recognised. And I think that is slowly changing, but we do have to push further and further in that direction. And I think that we will reap the benefits of it because we will have a much healthier um, community. I don't think we'll be stress-free. I don't think that's ever going to happen in science. Uh, finite resources uh, is the uh, writing on the wall. But uh, there's a very important movement called the San Francisco Declaration on Research Assessment, which just basically sets down, and it was developed by learner societies and publishers and, uh, and some of the funding institutions, sets down a, a, a short list of recommendations that give you ways of um, uh, going about your assessment which do not rely unduly on impact factors. So, um, uh, and I would encourage you to sign it. I'm trying to get Imperial College to sign it as an institution. I uh, haven't succeeded yet, but I'm still um, working on it. So ultimately, um, good communication, good science, I think, requires um, support. We've got to support our young people. And if we are going to do more good science communication and make sure that the scientific community is interacting um, in a constructive and a healthy way uh, with the rest of our society, then we do have to support um, everybody who, who does it, from the undergraduate to the PhD student um, to the postdoc to the geriatric um, professor. 
So um, in 25 years of science communication, I finally got through to my wife what I do. Um, but on the occasion, quite recent, of my 50th birthday, uh, she uh, uh, actually she didn't make this herself, but she commissioned uh, a cake, and uh, she was sort of recognising, I think, all the aspects of my uh, scientific output, so my research. So this is the only birthday cake I think where norovirus was deliberately added. Uh, but this is the this is the structure of the NS6 proteas, which we solved uh, a year or two ago. Uh, but also outreach activity, campaigning, uh, and our teaching. Oh, that's a bit out of focus, but that's a little copy of the origin of the species. So I want to uh, thank my wife for understanding uh, and I want to encourage uh, especially young people uh, in the audience that if you are nervous about it and uh, I would encourage old people to, um, to, to meet those fears and to offer the support uh, and to, um, as the SGM has done, show that there really is value in scientists getting out of the laboratory. So thank you very much for your attention and all I really need to do is sort of thank all the very people, the many, many people um, who have supported me uh, in preparing this talk and in over the last several years of science communication. Thank you very much. Uh, and it's a great pleasure to uh, give you the uh, 2014 Peter Wilder Prize for uh, Science Education and congratulations and thank you for a great talk.